Guys, I thought we'd do something a little bit different today. Because we're living in the ever-present shadow of the Super Nintendo, I thought it was about time that we figure out definitively what the best Super Nintendo games of all time are. And while I could easily tell you myself that the number one game is Blackthorn, a game that lets you shoot both in front and behind you, we thought it'd be more fair to let you guys decide. That is to say, I thought I'd let those who go to dorkly.com decide, and you already have. We got over 800,000 votes to definitively determine what the best Super Nintendo games of all time are, and I'll spoil it for you now, Blackthorn didn't make the list, uh, but I guess I'll still present this list to you, I guess. Here are the 25 best Super Nintendo games of all time, as picked by you, specifically you, Dan. There's a Dan watching this video. Number 25. Contrary to popular belief, a flashy sequel doesn't equal a bad sequel all the time. In a bold move, Contra 3 fast-forwarded the action to the distant future and improved not only the aesthetics, but the scope and storyline of the game, all while maintaining the run-and-gun appeal of the original. None have had a weapon as universally appealing as the spread gun. None. Number 24, Earthbound. Earthbound broke a lot of traditional rules established by previous Super Nintendo RPGs with its innovative, unique gameplay. To outsiders, Earthbound seemed like a cutesy kids game, but any well-informed game player would tell you otherwise. The characters had names like Buzz Buzz and Pooh, but it boasted a layered story with complicated characters and one of the most deeply unsettling final bosses in the history of gaming. While it might have hit the US before the heyday of Japanese RPGs, it's held on to an incredibly dedicated cult following. Number 23, Earthworm Jim 2. A solid follow-up, marred by terrible ports in years to come, the original version of Earthworm Jim 2 provided plenty of new features while adhering to its predecessor's insane pace and humor. While the first installment could have comfortably been classified as a platformer, the sequel launched traditional level design out the window like a cow off a catapult. One level had you bouncing puppies off a giant marshmallow, Game & Watch style. Another had you inexplicably playing as a cave salamander named Blind Sally. All this and the protagonist is still an earthworm in a supersuit. Groovy. Number 22, Kirby's Dream Land 3. If it ain't broke, don't fix it was probably a motto chanted by Kirby's Dream Land 3 developers. They didn't so much shatter the mold as smooth out the edges. New abilities to absorb and three new companions in the mix meant the player had a whole spectrum of new power combinations to explore. On top of that, it featured co-op gameplay and a gentle pastel art style, making it a perfect comfort game. Plus it had Kirby in it. That's probably why you voted for it. Look at him. Look at him, he's great. Number 21, F-Zero. As games have moved away from arcade-style life bars and towards autosaves and regenerating health, it's easy to forget how hard video games used to be. Nowadays, with enough time and patience, most any game can be waded through. F-Zero didn't give half a damn about some namby-pamby, new-agey, games-for-everybody philosophy, preferring instead to grind its players' egos down to nubs with impossibly fast racing, unpredictable obstacles, and uncannily skilled AI opponents. If you think you got frustrated playing Demon Souls, you have not played F-Zero. Number 20, The Secret of Mana. Final Fantasy was for shuttons. Secret of Mana was for kicking ass with buddies. The game offered wider opportunities for tactics and wit during battles, as well as beautiful visuals and a sophisticated player growth system. Setting itself apart from its RPG contemporaries, Secret of Mana featured a real-time combat system, teamwork-oriented co-op play for up to three players, and it streamlined clunky menu pages into intuitive in-game rings. It single-handedly justified the existence of the Super Multitab. What else were you using it for? Okay, besides Bomberman. Number 19, Super Castlevania 4. Besides having arguably the best name of any video game ever, Super Castlevania 4 was a triumph in other respects too. The new navigation and combat features helped not only make the game easier, but to enhance the entire experience. Graphical improvements over previous installments made exploring Dracula's castle that much more creepy, and the 16-bit score is one of the best on the console. While the Castlevania series is known for its non-linear level design, Super Castlevania 4 stuck to straight platforming. It had a heavy focus on weapons, especially Simon's signature whip, which he can now manipulate like a damn virtuoso. Whip it good, buddy. Number 18, Earthworm Jim. It's your classic tale of Earthworm finds ultra high tech indestructible super space cyber suit. Earthworm puts on ultra high tech indestructible super space cyber suit. Earthworm uses ultra high tech indestructible super space cyber suit to defeat Evil Crow. Holy crap, I can't believe I just said that. 
At the time of its release, Earthworm Jim was regaled for its impressive animation, refined gameplay, and heavy-handed comedic themes, and other things you don't have to be a professor monkey for a head to appreciate. It holds up shockingly well, its art and level design are still distinct and original. Despite occasionally clunky controls, Earthworm Jim is part of the grand tradition of off-the-wall games like Psychonauts and Monkey Island. You either love them, or you haven't played them. Number 17, Mortal Kombat. The original Mortal Kombat's one of the most controversial games of all time. The only thing it had in higher volume than gore and violence was people who wanted to play it. Mortal Kombat focused on Liu Kang's journey to save the Earth from the evil sorcerer Shang Tsung, but everyone else focused on the spine-rippingly good fatalities. Though lacking the refinement of a Street Fighter or the manic pace of Marvel vs. Capcom, Mortal Kombat was undeniably badass, especially juxtaposed against the backdrop of the Super Nintendo. Their portly Italian plumber spokesman barely decapitated anyone. When's the last time Mario decapitated anyone? Okay, besides your fanfic. Number 16, Final Fantasy II. But, you know, official title Final Fantasy IV. While the game has been re-released under its original title, Final Fantasy IV was originally known as Final Fantasy II outside of Japan. Believe it or not, there was a time when executives were afraid that the Final Fantasy series wouldn't appeal to Western gamers, and picked and chose what to send over. In any case, Final Fantasy IV was a major step forward in RPG storytelling. It paved the way for the rest of the series, and other RPGs in general. Also, suck at Final Fantasy VII, because Final Fantasy IV was killing off main characters way before it was cool. Number 15, Mortal Kombat 2. Considered by some to be the greatest fighting game ever, or at very least the best Mortal Kombat game, it's no surprise that game players rank it as one of the greatest SNES games of all time. Mortal Kombat 2 introduced a slew of brutal new fatalities and added babalities and friendships to the mix, sprinkle in a few secret characters and the ability to play as Mortal Kombat boss Shang Tsung, more playable ninjas because they hadn't run out of colors for the palette swaps yet, and you've got yourself a hit on the hands. Very toasty. Yeah, like the guy says in the game. Number 14, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. We are on a real string of twos here, maybe because second really is the best. The prequel to the Mario Brothers series, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, gives you the apparently much demanded backstory of how the bros and their sweet dino companion came to be, sparing many parents the awkward experience of explaining where baby Mario's come from. Yoshi's Island maintained its predecessor's excellent platforming and added a unique focus on puzzle solving. It had a beautiful hand-drawn aesthetic to accompany its delightfully idiosyncratic game mechanics. What it lacks in princesses and fully grown adult characters, it makes up for in being able to control dinosaurs, which is all anyone could ever ask for. Number 13, Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Another two, big surprise. Credited with starting the great fighting game craze of the 1990s, Street Fighter 2 Turbo was the reason everyone was kung fu street fighting. Kids were begging their parents to let them get their flying spin kicks and fireballs on, which was a little bit frightening for CPU-controlled opponents and vocal anti-violence against cars activists alike. While the arcade version is responsible for draining hundreds of thousands of dollars of allowance money, the Super Nintendo version allowed for game players to beat the shit out of each other in front of pixelated onlookers over and over and over at no additional charge. Number 12, Turtles in Time. Not a 2, but a sequel still. A side-scrolling sequel to the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game, Turtles in Time brought the radical pizza-eating reptiles back where they belong, to your personal television screen. Based on the animated series, you controlled your favorite turtle as they slid, dashed, and jumped around the sewers and streets of New York City, trying to cowabungle the plans of the evil Shredder. Also, there was time travel. If that doesn't sound totally awesome to you, you must have had toxic waste dropped on your head as a baby. I'm sorry, that was mean. Number 11, Final Fantasy III. Official title, Final Fantasy VI. Commercially successful and critically acclaimed, Final Fantasy VI was easily the best Final Fantasy game when it was released. The game opened the floodgates for the franchise. Every Final Fantasy game since then has been given a Western release, no longer forcing publishers to change the names of games. VI also featured 14 playable characters and a level of storytelling head and shoulders above anything seen in an RPG up to that point. While it lacks the same widespread appeal as Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VI will always be game players' favorite Final Fantasy. Number 10, Donkey Kong Country 2. Expanding upon the runaway success of the first installment, Donkey Kong Country 2 introduced more collectibles and animal companions. With a new pirate theme and featuring Diddy Kong and his girlfriend Dixie, Donkey Kong Country 2 proved that Donkey Kong Country games didn't need the titular ape to move units. It was an improvement over its predecessor in almost every way, with an orchestral soundtrack, higher difficulty level, and better graphics. Though it can't quite unseat the original's classic status. Number 9, Star Fox. 
In the original Star Fox, Fox McLeod and his team of zoo animals embark on their first battle against the forces of Andros. Star Fox featured graphics revolutionary for its time, utilizing the much-hyped Super FX microchip. It was a game of firsts, the first true 3D Nintendo game, the first installment in a core Nintendo franchise, and the first time animals were put in spaceships without upsetting animal rights organizations. Memorable not only for its face-melting polygons and big polygonal faces, Star Fox also introduced us to Slippy, a weird, horrible, sexless troll creature that would haunt our dreams for years to come. As Falco would say, daba doo dada. Number 8, Mega Man X. The original Mega Man games were bright, breezy, colorful, and hair-pullingly difficult romps populated by cute robots and memorable bosses. Mega Man X switched up the setting and added in new gameplay elements without sacrificing the formula that made the original game's classics. It dialed back the punishing difficulty and added dashing, wall jumping, and the ability to charge special weapons. Mega Man X was designed to make you feel like the penultimate dystopian badass. The ultimate, of course, is Zero. Number 7, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. Bowser and Mario working together, mass hysteria. Before Super Mario RPG, that was merely a pipe dream, pun intended, I'm sorry though. Developed by the RPG Wizards at Square, under the guidance of video game maestro Shigeru Miyamoto, and published by Nintendo, Super Mario RPG cast the characters of the Mushroom Kingdom in a new light. Rather than a standard top-down world crawl, Super Mario RPG played like an isometric platformer, complete with the block hopping and brick smashing of traditional Mario games while adding a new dimension to exploration. The battle system, too, added layers to the formula by including timed button presses, making combat fast-paced and engaging. The ultimate shouldn't work but totally does game, Super Mario RPG broke all the rules of plumber role-playing. The box art is just truly awful though, isn't it? Number 6, Chrono Trigger. Made by the dream team of Square developers, Chrono Trigger revolutionized the RPG genre. Praised by critics and loved by fans, this game had it all. Multiple endings, time travel, and an anthropomorphic frog knight. Starring the greatest mute protagonist this side of Hyrule, Chrono Trigger combined traditional turn-based combat with a sophisticated combo system. When somebody starts playing Chrono Trigger, it's not a question of whether he or she will play through the entire game, it's a question of how many times. Number 5, Super Metroid. People don't love Super Metroid because of its unbelievably slick control scheme, its kick-ass weapons or power-ups, and its cornucopia of secret moves to impress your friends and separate the men from boys. People love Super Metroid because it's got atmosphere like you wouldn't believe. Between the enormous sinister sandbox world of Zebus and the goosebump-inducing 16-bit soundtrack, Super Metroid combined the claustrophobia and loneliness of Alien with the badassness of Boba Fett and packaged it all up in a perfectly polished platformer. Facing off against Kraid, Ridley, and Mother Brain, the holy trinity of terrifying boss battles, is just icing on the cake. Number 4, Donkey Kong Country. As if a game featuring a giant ape who beats up alligators and rides a rhinoceros would be anything other than the top 5. Easily the most classic Super Nintendo game about a primate with a tie, Donkey Kong Country deserves praise simply for putting its developer Rare on the map. Kicking off a spree of little-known games like GoldenEye 007, Perfect Dark, and Conker's Bad Fur Day. Their first mega hit was no slouch either, with pseudo-3D graphics that pushed the SNES to its limits, co-op gameplay, and tons of level variety. Number 3, Super Mario Kart. Like the giant squid and the sperm whale, Super Mario Kart is doomed to wrestle forever with its sibling Mario Kart 64 for ultimate kart status. Luckily, our readers didn't have to make that Sophie's choice. In terms of sheer total hours of playtime accumulated, Super Mario Kart easily blows away any competitors, largely because it's the most easily picked up and played game on the Super Nintendo or any other console. It's so good that you could almost forgive it for establishing the precedent of spelling things with a K. Number 2, Super Mario World. It's the highest selling SNES game that brought Mario to the next generation. From the expansive world to the bonus levels and the easter eggs, there were hours of interesting and expansive gameplay. Super Mario World kept all of the awesome platforming that made the originals classics, and topped it off with everyone's favorite Jolly Green Dinosaur. The addition of Yoshi was undoubtedly Super Mario World's biggest contribution to the Mario franchise. While riding Yoshi, players could finally play a Mario game where the character was not restricted to just using jumps as his main attack. Now they could devour opponents and literally spit fire. Sure, Mario Bros. 2 had a bigger roster, but Yoshi was more fun to control than any of those other characters by far. And number 1, Blackthorn. No! Oh my god, what? It's a link to the past, obviously. Simply describing a link to the past barely does it justice. The scope and scale is awesome! Your epic quest spans hundreds of game miles across two worlds. The game introduced tons of what would become staples of the series. Chief among them, the Master Sword, the Hookshot, the Spin Attack, and Zelda's distinctive pink and white dress. 
it significantly expanded the mythology of Hyrule and the Triforce. Even ignoring its legacy, A Link to the Past is a spectacular game. After all, how many 20 to 30 hour games make you want to start right over from the beginning the minute that you beat them? The puzzles are mind bending, the bosses are challenging, the dungeons are masterfully designed, the combat is simple and perfect, the side quests engaging, the easter eggs are delightful, the items are endlessly creative, the stakes are high, and the world of Hyrule is gorgeous, mysterious, and as vast as it's ever been. Until, you know, recently. A Link to the Past is a testament to the power of imagination and ambition in video games, and we are proud to rank it as the greatest Super Nintendo game ever. Look, I guess I can't fault you for not putting Blackthorn on the list. Those are some pretty solid choices. And besides, I know you're gonna vote at number one for the Sega 32X. Thanks, guys. Thanks for looking out for my interests, specifically. In front and behind you! That's twice as much shooting as most things!